from Florence, Italy. The city of inspiration for sculptors in ages past and for centuries to come. You're listening to The Sculptor's Funeral. Good day to you all, and welcome again to The Sculptor's Funeral, the podcast for figurative sculptors and lovers of sculpture everywhere around the world. I am your host, Jason Arkles a sculptor and instructor living and working in Florence, Italy, where all the great sculptors are dead. And I don't feel so well myself. And in today's podcast, we pick up the thread of where we left off with last season, and that is with the phenomenon of American sculptors studying and working in Italy in the 19th century. In the introduction to the last episode, the one on Hiram Powers, I talked a little about how Americans studying art abroad at this time were largely unfettered, by the many constraints placed upon European students of sculpture. For instance, European nations each had national academies that not only instructed students in the craft of sculpture, but also dictated a national taste to a greater or lesser degree. Now, in contrast, American sculptors had no governing or instructional body, which, of course, is why they had to go to Europe to learn sculpture in the first place. And so once an American sculptor left their European master, they were very free to choose any style or aesthetic or subject that they wanted or that their American clients might suggest. But not only was there a difference in what American sculpture could be vis-a-vis European sculpture, but also in who sculptors were, the sort of person who was drawn into sculpture. Hiram Powers is a great example of this, almost to the point of a stereotype. I mean, he's, a, he's the typical New England self-made man. He's good with his hands. He's an inventor as well as a sculptor, and a man who learnt by doing and who met each obstacle with determination and grit. And above all, he was an independently thinking artist who selected what he thought was worthy in the European tradition of art and culture, and he discarded and ignored what he didn't think was worthy despite what his European peers might think of him. He had that rugged individualism which was seen as a quintessentially American trait. Now, the subject of today's podcast, Harriet Hosmer, is of a very similar character, a sculptor who achieved success through a combination of a little luck and a lot of hard work, someone who never lost her sense of individuality, someone who did her own thing to the point that flouting convention was what she was probably best known for apart from her sculpture. I mean, her very choice of profession was a challenge to convention because, of course, Harriet Hosmer was a woman. I haven't really talked too much about female sculptors on this podcast simply because, historically, there were very few of them around until the latter part of the 19th century. There are so many reasons for this. To start, the general conception of sculpture was that it was man's work, heavy, sweaty toil for the most part. If a woman was going to practice art, she might turn to painting or music, or if her interests ran to the plastic arts, she might be guided towards cameo cutting or pottery. To some extent, what kept women away from sculpture was the societal presumption of what women were capable of, but equally, it was the general presumption of what sculpture consisted of. Now, it's been centuries since figurative sculptors were lone craftsmen in studios toiling away under a block of marble. Sculpture in the 19th century was practiced essentially as it is today, with the sculptor being chiefly a modeler in clay or wax, and specialist craftsmen such as carvers or foundry workers commonly brought in for the heavy labor. Now, there were and are tons of exceptions to this, of course, but the option for assistance was there then as now. The practice of figurative sculpture does not have to be heavy labor if one so chooses. In addition to this, though, was the institutional sexism which prevailed in the studios and academies of Europe. There were private ateliers that would train women. That tradition goes all the way back to the Baroque era. But training in the national academies as well as professional employment was a rarity. The few women who worked professionally before 1850 were usually wealthy nobility who were privately trained or were women trained by sculptors who were also their fathers or uncles or husbands. Marie Anne Collot, for instance, was the niece of the sculptor Etienne Falconet. She was actively sculpting portraits for the court of Catherine the Great in Russia in the 1770s, but gave up the profession to raise her child and run her husband's household. And that, of course, brings up another strike against the possibility of women becoming sculptors. 
There was the social pressure and expectation that women should get married and raise a family, or at least provide a comfortable domestic household for their husbands. A dual career of housewife and sculptor is generally too much for any one person. So generally, if you were a woman who wanted to sculpt like Marie Anne Collot, you had to do it before you got married. But there was another option. You could do it after your husband died. The British sculptor Anne Seymour Dahmer is an example of this. She was working around the same time as Marie Anne Collot, but Dahmer's career only started after her husband died in the 1770s. Her husband happened to have been the wealthy Earl of Dorchester, and this enabled the widow Dahmer to hire acclaimed private tutors, travel widely, and receive portrait bust commissions from her indulgent societal peers and acquaintances. And we see this pattern repeat well into the 19th century. The widowed Swiss duchess Adèle Daffry came to Paris after the death of her husband, studied privately under several notable sculptors like Antoine Louis Berry and August Clessinger, but when she applied to enter the École de Beaux-Arts, in 1861, her application was denied. She did go on to exhibit at the Paris Salon, but she felt she could only do so after taking on a masculine pseudonym. Professionally, Adèle Daffry was known as Marcello. Now, I just mentioned that Adèle Daffry's application to the École de Beaux-Arts was denied when she applied in 1861. Well, in fact, all women were refused entry into the École de Beaux-Arts until 1897. 1897. That's just crazy. That's, I mean, all the way up to the 20th century, women could not study in Paris at the École de Beaux-Arts. But it's something to keep in mind when examining female sculptors who worked previous to the 20th century. Each of them, just by virtue of having had a career at all, should be regarded as exceptional. Each of them made it in spite of all the cards stacked against them. Sexism, societal expectation, Institutional disenfranchisement, all stacked on top of all the, the other usual hardships that every artist faces when trying to start their career. So, although in this episode I am telling the story of Harriet Hosmer, and telling it with an emphasis on her unconventionality, Hosmer is far from the first female sculptor to achieve success, and in looking at female sculptors of past centuries as a group, we see that an unconventional personality and an unconventional temperament such as Harriet Hosmer possessed, was completely typical to female sculptors. One last thing before we get into Harriet Hosmer's life. Uh, occasionally, I do podcasts on sculptors for whom there exists relatively little information outside of one or two sources. And when that happens, I like to acknowledge these sources. So for Harriet Hosmer, I am getting virtually all my info from a single text, a book entitled Harriet Hosmer, A Cultural Biography by Kate Culkin, it was published in 2010. It is basically the book on Harriet Hosmer, and much of the info presented in this fantastic book has never been readily available before this publication. So if the topics covered by this episode interest you, definitely get the book by Kate Culkin, with a K. Uh, there's, just, there's just so much of her life and times uh, that I can't cover here, especially regarding the context of gender and sexual politics and the broader context of 19th century American culture. It's also an excellent starting point if you want to learn more about female sculptors in general in the 19th century, of which Harriet Hosmer was one of many. So, Harriet Hosmer. She was born in 1830 near Boston, Massachusetts, to a prominent physician. By the time Harriet was eight years old, her mother and her two brothers had died of tuberculosis, and her father, Dr. Hosmer, resolved to raise Harriet and her older sister, Helen, to be vigorous, strong, and healthy in order that they do not succumb to the same fate. The girls spent their childhood hunting and fishing, hiking and boating, and generally exploring the forests and rivers of Massachusetts with their father. However, Harriet's sister Helen did die of tuberculosis when Harriet was just 12 years old. But Harriet, despite the deaths of everyone else in her family but her father, she seemed to thrive. In fact, she quickly gained a reputation for being half-wild, in addition to her unladylike athleticism and a natural disliking for authority, she had a wickedly mischievous streak in her as a teenager. And this led her to doing all sorts of mischief, like stealing railroad carts and almost causing a train wreck, or the one time where she decided to write an obituary for her hometown's other doctor, her father's rival, 
and somehow convincing the newspaper to publish it as real. She got in a lot of trouble for that. So, hoping to tame Harriet a bit as well as educate her, her father sent her off to a boarding school when she was 16 years old. But this was no ordinary New England girls' school. This was the Sedgwick School, nestled in the Berkshire Mountains of Massachusetts. The Sedgwick School was run by Elizabeth Sedgwick, the wife of a prominent lawyer from an old New England family. And Elizabeth Sedgwick ran one of the most progressive schools for girls in the United States at the time, instilling a love of learning in her students and creating an intellectually challenging environment designed to nurture strong, independent women. Now, in the 1840s in the United States, this was practically unique. The Sedgwick School had the added advantage of being the center of intellectual and social life in the Berkshires. Elizabeth's sister-in-law was the internationally acclaimed author Catherine Sedgwick, and the school and the Sedgwick home was frequented by such literati as Daniel Webster, Washington Irving, and the celebrated actress Fanny Kemble. Now, Harriet Hosmer flourished in this setting, transforming from a rambunctious youth with too little to do into a self-possessed, energetic, educated, and opinionated young woman. She was also, according to everyone, the life of the party, entertaining people with humorous poems and songs that she would compose herself, and for a while she actually contemplated becoming an actress. At the Sedgwick School, she made several lifelong friends, including a young woman from St. Louis named Cornelia Crow, whose family would more or less adopt Harriet after she left school. And finally, the Sedgwick School is where Harriet seems to have recognized her sexual attraction to women. I mention this fact not to titillate, but because Harriet Hosmer's sexuality will play a significant role, both in her personal biography and in the choice of subject matter in her sculpture, as we will see. So after three years at the Sedgwick School at the age of 19, Harriet returned to Boston, apparently already determined to study sculpture. She took modeling lessons from a local sculptor named Peter Stevenson and also looked around to find a way to study anatomy. But being female, she was denied entry into several medical school classes as the thought of men and women in the same room discussing human anatomy was a bit beyond the pale in 1840s New England. And the thought of women dissecting cadavers was practically unthinkable. A solution arose through the assistance of Wayman Crow her friend Cornelia's father. With his influence, Harriet was able to enroll in a medical school in St. Louis, and so in 1850, Harriet Hosmer moved to St. Louis, Missouri, and took up residence with the Crow family. Coincidentally, her anatomy teacher in St. Louis, Dr. McDowell, was the very same instructor who taught anatomy to Hiram Powers in Cincinnati, Ohio, two decades before. After studying for a year, Harriet returned to Boston and set up a studio in her father's garden eager to start her own work, and spending most of her free time in the Boston Athenaeum, soaking up the influence of European sculpture through its plaster cast collection. The Athenaeum, if you will remember from the Horatio Greeno episode, was one of the only places in the U.S. where study of European sculpture was possible. Quite ambitiously, Harriet's first attempt at sculpture was to make a copy in marble of Antonio Canova's bust of Napoleon which she completed and gave to her father. Her second work was an original creation, a, a portrait relief of her anatomy teacher, Dr. McDowell, and this actually met with a lot of praise from those who saw it when she shipped it to Dr. McDowell in St. Louis. It was displayed in the medical school's museum, and there was an article about it in the Cincinnati paper that was then reprinted in the leading Boston newspaper. So spurred on by this initial success, in the next year, in 1852, Harriet carved her first original marble bust in the round, an ideal bust of Hesper, the Evening Star, an allegorical figure from a Tennyson poem. It's done in the neoclassical style, naturally, as the example of Antonia Canova is just about the only example to be found for sculpture in New England, apart from classical works. There was also, of course, Hiram Powers, who had recently made waves in America with his masterpiece, The Greek Slave, but he himself was a Canovian neoclassicist. But although neoclassicism was a style ubiquitous in the work of aspiring American sculptors, and still practiced by many in Italy, it was a style which, in many places, was being replaced by the more progressive Romanticism, a more naturalistic style, drawing on more emotional themes and subjects. 
but neoclassicism was all sculptors like Hosmer and other Americans on American soil were exposed to at that time. Harriet Hosmer's bust of Hesper, the Evening Star, is truncated below the bare breast, very similar in form and truncation to a popular bust edition of Hiram Power's Greek Slave, and it's difficult to imagine a stronger or more relevant role model for Harriet Hosmer than Hiram Powers at this point. Hosmer's bust of Hesper the Evening Star made her famous in Boston, not merely because she was about the only person in Boston doing such work at the time, but also because she was a woman, a, quote, lady sculptor. Now, the fact that a diminutive young woman could take on such a task as carving marble, normally considered the province of strong men, earned her the reputation as that of an emancipated female and earned her the support of champions of women's rights and women's suffrage movements, which were just at that time gaining ground in the United States, side by side with the abolitionist movement. One prominent abolitionist and women's rights figure was the Boston author Lydia Child, who wrote a glowing review of the bust of Hesper, the Evening Star, for the New York Journal. And this is going to be a pattern in Harriet's career. She will be assisted in significant ways, time and again, by influential people who admire and support her, not only on a personal and professional level, and from all accounts, everyone adored Harriet Hosmer's character, but also by what she represented in the larger culture. She was seen as an emancipated woman, and those fighting for women's rights would often hold her up as an example of what a woman in the 19th century could be capable of. Even so, at this point, we might predict that Harriet Hosmer's life would follow another pattern, the, the familiar pattern seen in earlier female sculptors' lives. She's not yet married, and as the daughter of a wealthy and influential man with many social connections, Harriet easily could have settled into the role of a society portrait sculptor in Boston. But as luck would have it, Harriet, in 1851, met an individual that would change her life, a woman then known as the most famous actress in the United States, just finishing her farewell tour, the actress Charlotte Cushman. Now, Harriet met Charlotte Cushman through a mutual friend, and the two hit it off immediately. They apparently shared a strong mutual attraction, though Cushman was then in a relationship with the British author Matilda Hayes. But the attraction for Harriet wasn't merely romantic or sexual, if it was even that. In Charlotte Cushman, Harriet Hosmer found a role model, an independent, unmarried, career-minded female in a loving relationship with another woman. And what's more, her friendship with Cushman offered professional opportunity. Cushman and her partner, Matilda Hayes, were about to sail to Rome to live for an extended period, and they invited Hosmer to join them. Italy, of course, was seen as a mandatory step in the education of any American sculptor, and as such, an invitation was too tempting to refuse. So at the age of 22, in 1852, Harriet Hosmer and her father set sail for Europe. Harriet Hosmer's arrival to Rome was really, really different from the experience of other earlier American artists who had come to study in Italy. Her social connections, her father's social connections, and her companions, and even the American press, were all rooting for her success and assisting her at every turn. Now, to be sure, Harriet was an energetic and resourceful person, and she probably would have done just fine on her own. But she never had to rely on her own, nor did she have to struggle for recognition in the early days. She had achieved that before she got off the boat, because traveling along in Harriet's party was Grace Greenwood, a popular newspaper columnist who had written a glowing review of Harriet's work up to that time, and Greenwood's latest venture was to travel Europe and write a regular column for newspapers uh, back home in the States about her travels. And Harriet featured in these columns prominently. And so the American public was following the beginnings of Harriet's career practically in real time, or at least the closest thing to real time the 19th century could offer a wide audience. So Charlotte Cushman rented a large house near the Spanish Steps in Rome, and they all moved in, Charlotte and Matilda, Harriet and her father, and also the writer Grace Greenwood. Harriet almost immediately became the pupil of the most prominent sculptor in Rome, John Gibson, who had himself been a pupil of Canova, 
and probably the closest adherent to Canovian neoclassicism at the time in Rome. And the time was, remember, 1852. Now, elsewhere in Europe, as I mentioned, neoclassicism was becoming positively old-fashioned, or at least more or less representative of an older culture and older political milieu, which was being quickly replaced by the passion and originality, not to say the decadence, of Romanticism. Harriet was arriving in Rome only two years ahead of the recent winner of the Prix de Rome, Jean-Baptiste Carpeau, for instance, who would produce his masterpiece of Romanticism, Ugolino and his sons, in less than a decade. However, Rome was still a bastion of conservatism in the arts, thanks to the legacy of, well, the, the ruins of ancient Rome in Rome, and also to Canova, and also to the academies of Europe who had scholastic outposts in Rome, like France's Académie de France, whose purpose was to instill the classic ideal into the minds of young artists, who would later serve French taste. So Rome was, as I said, a bastion of conservatism in the arts at this time. After all, Carpo's Ugolino, uh, you know, that was, that was groundbreaking for several reasons, but it was, at least in part, because it was so at odds with everything else going around him in Rome. But conservative neoclassicism suited Americans just fine. The look of neoclassical art was synonymous with old-world respectability, perfect taste, and sophistication, something that both American artists and their New World clients, including the government of the United States, were eager to obtain. Now, that goal of acquiring respectability and authority through neoclassicism was met with limited success, of course, as inevitably American sculpture would be flavored by American ideals and American culture. And such is the case with Harriet Hosmer, as we shall see when the sculptor's funeral continues. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Just a few quick notes before we continue with Harriet Hosmer. This is the first podcast episode of the third season. As you may know, I have been on break from the podcast all summer in order to do some teaching and also to move into a new studio here in Florence. Funny thing about that new studio. Let me tell you a story. Uh, back in May, the day before I was to start moving into that new studio, which happens to be located right on the south bank of the Arno River in central Florence, a water main under the street outside my studio door burst, and burst pretty catastrophically. It created an enormous sinkhole in the road which swallowed up over 20 parked cars and which nearly collapsed the embankment of the river. It was a huge deal. It made the international news. You, maybe you saw the post I made about it on, on the Facebook group page. Anyway, no one was hurt, which was pretty incredible, but but what it meant for me, personally, was that I now had no vehicle access to my studio. Couldn't get a car within 200 feet of my front door. And in fact, I still don't have any access. Uh, there is a huge construction site right outside my studio door, and it will be there for who knows how long. Anyway, the upshot was that I had to move my studio anyway, and I had to do it by hand with a hand cart, you know, a little trolley from my old studio a half mile away, piece by piece, sculptures, chunks of marble, shelving, furniture, everything, all by hand. And it took me three solid months, and in fact, I'm still not entirely done. And what this means for you, dear listeners, is that I have spent almost no time in preparation for season three of The Sculptor's Funeral, which is why this first episode of the season is coming out in mid-October instead of the first week of October, as I planned. So that's why. So I've heard from many of you asking, when is the new season going to start? And I'm so sorry, but now you know why it's coming a little late. So anyway, with, with uh, a full season of uh, teaching starting up for me, and I got some commissions going on, I need to announce a schedule change for upcoming podcasts of The Sculptor's Funeral. Now, the first two seasons were weekly podcasts, which was pretty ambitious on my part. Uh, but I am a bit of a workaholic, and and it was it was fun for me, actually, to get up at 6 a.m. most days and write a few pages and read a few chapters before going into the studio. But but I need to face the reality of my upcoming schedule and scale things back a bit. So I would I would rather offer fewer podcasts on a regular schedule than shoot for a weekly release and occasionally fail. So from here on out, podcasts will release twice a month on the first and the 15th of the month. 
And yeah, I know this didn't come out till the 16th. Um, so anyway, look for the next podcast right on the 1st of November. Upcoming episodes include several interviews with some really interesting people and history podcasts uh, on more American sculptors, including Daniel Chester French, Augustus St. Gaudens, and uh, I'm going to do one on the Chicago World's Fair as well, which is a really, really, really cool topic for sculptors. I hope you keep listening and keep telling others about the podcast, especially those who are just uh, starting their training in, in the studios and ateliers around the world. The info I present here on the podcast is exactly the sort of thing I wish I had access to when I was starting to sculpt, and it makes me especially happy when I meet a first-year student who can talk and think about art history in the context of their own pursuits. And I think it's a key component, actually, to producing a more mature artist and a more mature art movement, if that's what this really is. And uh, I'm honored and humbled to be a part of that. And now back to Harriet Hosmer. So, after a year under John Gibson's tutelage, which seemed to consist mostly of copying the works of Canova, Harriet Hosmer starts producing original work. She makes a bust of Medusa and another of Daphne, two classical themes with lots of precedence in sculpture. Canova himself made a Perseus with the severed head of Medusa, and of course Bernini's famous Apollo and Daphne is how most of us listening are familiar with the character of Daphne a beautiful maiden who is transformed into a laurel tree in order to escape the pursuing god Apollo. Now, both Canova's Perseus and the Apollo and Daphne are in Rome, and Harriet certainly would have been familiar with them. But it hardly seems as though either of these works inspired her when looking at her own versions of these subjects. Harriet Hosmer's Daphne is not an active, writhing Daphne, such as we find with Bernini. No, instead, Hosmer's Daphne looks positively, passively resigned to her fate, with her head bowed, giving off a, a somber mood similar, similar to the uh, earlier bust of Hesper the Evening Star. The only clue to the bust's identity as Daphne lies in the laurel wreath around uh, the truncation of the bust. It sort of frames the truncation of the bust on the border between the sculpture and the base. Now, in the Medusa, we find a somewhat blandly neoclassical female bust, this time with her head raised up instead of looking down like in the Daphne. And the clue to her identity, once again, is found only in the decorative framing of the truncation, which utilizes a few entwined serpents, basically doing the same thing that uh, the laurels do in the bust of Daphne. A few tendrils of the bust's hair are also uh, turning into serpents' heads, though they are hardly the writhing mass we find in Canova or in Benvenuto Cellini's Perseus and Medusa in Florence. Now, how strange that Hosmer would choose to represent two such diverse characters in such similar ways. I mean, stylistically, these two busts, you know, these sort of neoclassical busts, they could be companion pieces for each other, even though one is a Medusa and the other is a Daphne. So, are either of these busts good? <laughs> are they even better than average? Are, are they notable in any way? Well, uh, no, not really, not least on a technical or artistic level. But they are notable works in the context of Harriet's place in the history of art as one of the first independent female sculptors. They are notable on the basis of their subject matter and what the characters of Medusa and Daphne actually have in common. Now, at first, Medusa and Daphne seem like vastly different subjects, a hideous gorgon who can turn men into stone, and a beautiful maiden pursued by a god. But if you know your classical mythology, you know that Medusa was once also a beautiful maiden, a daughter of a minor sea god who was raped by the major sea god Poseidon. Now, Poseidon happened to commit this rape in the temple of Athena which angered Athena, and so naturally Athena doled out punishment. But not to the rapist, Apollo, but to his victim, Medusa, transforming her into a creature so ugly it literally killed men to look at her. The tragedy of the character of Medusa is the Medusa we find in Hosmer's bust, a beautiful maiden with her eyes raised skyward as though pleading for mercy 
in the midst of her disfigurement and transformation. And knowing this, we see an obvious connection to Daphne. Both women were transformed, or rather deformed, as a result of being desired by men. One transformation was a punishment, and in the case of Daphne, it was a means of escape. Harriet Hosmer would have known the complete story of Medusa and of Daphne, and although I usually don't like to guess the intentions of sculptors without more concrete references, it certainly would be naive to think that the connection between these two characters is coincidental. And of course, this connection isn't even my idea. It was made, um, this connection was made by the author Kate Culkin, uh, whose book has informed my view of Hosmer, and I'm agreeing with her insight. Culkin goes further, actually, in her discussion about these busts, citing them as examples of Harriet's expression of the complications of her sexuality. Harriet Hosmer lived in a world dominated by men, where women who were attracted to other women had to disguise their relationships and their desires out of fear of punishment. Throughout her life, actually, Hosmer publicly declared herself to be a champion of chastity and celibacy, affirming many times that she was too passionate for her sculpture and for her work to have room for a marriage. Now, this was actually one of the many coping strategies she apparently learned from the actress Charlotte Cushman, her role model, uh, who publicly affirmed the same thing about marriage uh, throughout her own life. Now, these public declarations were a means of throwing off any suspicions about their unmarried status, while throughout her life, Harriet actually had many affairs and a few very long-term loving relationships with women, which she seldom kept a secret from her close circle of friends, both male and female. So looking at the, the busts of Medusa and Daphne in the context of her personal life, it would almost seem that the public affirmation of celibacy was Harriet's own personal deformation, imposed upon her by society, much in the same way the guise of a laurel tree or of a gorgon were imposed upon Medusa and Daphne. And again, I agree with Kate Culkin on these points, and I think it's an important consideration when looking at Harriet Hosmer's sculpture throughout her career. Most of Harriet's work, when the subject matter was her own choice, were of women dealing with power and powerlessness in a sexualized context, or at least in the context of gender relations and gender identity. So, um, for those of you who have listened to a lot of my podcasts, you might think that my agreement with the idea that Hosmer's sculptures were in part a reflection of and an expression of her sexuality might seem a little contradictory, you know, in light of a few statements that I've made in other podcasts, notably the Michelangelo and the Donatello podcasts. Now, in those podcasts, I've railed against art historians who try to attribute the masculine physicality of Michelangelo's women to his sexuality or the femininity of Donatello's Bronze David to Donatello's sexual preferences. Now, I've argued that there are well-documented and sound reasons for these phenomena outside the sexual identity of the artists. And I won't go into those arguments here. You can just listen to the podcast I've already done. So why is it different with Harriet Hosmer and her sexuality? Well, it's different because with Harriet, uh, art itself was different in the 19th century compared to the 15th and 16th centuries. The notion of the role of art as a vehicle for self-expression was a pretty foreign idea in the Renaissance. It wasn't non-existent, but it was also generally not a factor in how art was made. Also, the works by Donatello and Michelangelo, which purport to convey these expressions, were commissions, right? These were not works selected out of personal interest, such as Harriet's work. Now, if, if it ever would have occurred to you to express the nature of your sexuality through your art in the Renaissance, you probably wouldn't choose to do so in a high-stakes commission for the House of Medici. In contrast, Harriet Hosmer was free to sculpt whatever she felt like sculpting. And time and again, we see her gravitate towards themes that seem to be informed by her personal experience. An example of this can be found in the commission she was given by Wayman Crow, her friend Cornelia's father, back in St. Louis. And that occurred just, uh, just after she completed the busts of Medusa and Daphne. Now, Wayman Crow commissioned a life-size marble figure from Harriet, and he left the choice of subject up to her. And she chose the subject of Anon, 
Anon was the wife of Paris, the same Paris who uh, figures prominently in the story of the Trojan War. Now, his wife, Anon, is a character you really don't hear much about because we always associate the Greek hero Paris with Helen of Troy. But Paris left his wife, Anon, for Helen, which, of course, sparked the Trojan War. Anon was a woman abandoned by her supposed lover and protector, her husband, and in the end, when Paris was killed, Anon throws herself onto his funeral pyre. So Anon is yet another subject whose theme touches upon a woman alienated and abused in the world of men. Hosmer's work clearly is following a pattern. Now another pattern we find in Harriet Hosmer's choices of subject is a literary connection. Like her first bust, Hesper the Evening Star, Anon is the subject of a poem by Alfred Lord Tennyson. As unknown as Anon might be to us today, the identity of Anon would have been generally recognized in 1855 due to Tennyson's poem. And Harriet is far from the only American sculptor or American artist turning to popular literature for choice of subject matter. In fact, it makes perfect sense for American sculptors to do so. I mean, the characters of classical mythology were not exactly on the tips of the average American's tongue. So if sculptors in Rome were limited largely to classical references and classical figures, it would be a good idea to choose classical subjects that might have been made more familiar to the American audience by other means, like poetry or novels or plays. Throughout her career, Hosmer will turn to popular literature from contemporary writers to Shakespeare for her source material. Now, Harriet Hosmer by this time was well known in Rome and abroad, just within a few years after her arrival, and although commissions were relatively few and far between, she did sell well, including many copies of the work that she made out of her own interests, like the busts already mentioned. Her largest commercial success came in the form of one of her smallest works. She made a small figure of an infant with bat's wings, sitting on a toadstool and clutching a serpent. Now, this rather satanic little puto was Harriet's rendition of the character of Puck from A Midsummer Night's Dream. It's a great little decorative piece, and it reminds me uh, maybe of Verrocchio's Puto with a Dolphin in terms of its charm, its cuteness. Probably the strangest thing about this little guy, though, is not the serpent or the toadstool, but the fact that its face is purportedly a self-portrait of Harriet Hosmer. And looking at photos to compare this little imp's face with Harriet Hosmer's, there definitely are similarities. Now, whether Harriet Hosmer saw herself as a mischievous imp and intended the resemblance, or whether this was just a, an instance of the old saying that every portrait is a self-portrait, we can't really be sure. Harriet Hosmer's more notable commissions at this time include the tomb for a young woman who died in Rome, and this tomb happened to be the first tomb for a church in Rome created by an American sculptor. It's a reclining effigy on a deathbed, a familiar type in Italy. Well done, but not outstanding in any way. The sculpture of Hosmer, probably most familiar to American audiences today, would have to be the monumental figure of Thomas Hart Benton, which stands in Lafayette Park in St. Louis, Missouri. Thomas Hart Benton was the firebrand senator for Missouri, who was a champion of the policies of Andrew Jackson and westward expansion in the fledgling United States, but he was also an opponent of slavery. Now, he had died in 1858, and Harriet had been commissioned by the city of St. Louis for a statue of him in 1860. The sculpture is sort of a mixture of neoclassical composition and drapery with a realistic portrait and contemporary clothing and Hosmer worked on it throughout the first half of the 1860s in Rome, and it was delivered and installed just after the end of the Civil War in 1868. Now, the sculpture was unveiled with great fanfare, but it fell a little short of greatness in the eyes of many, both in the sculpture itself, in terms of the quality, and also what the sculpture hoped to represent. When the commission first arose, it was to honor a man who tried to keep the Union of the United States together. Of course, this was all before the Civil War. Also, it was, you know, supposed to be honoring a man who envisioned St. Louis as a rising, powerful city, the gateway to the West. Now, after the Civil War, and in later decades, 
the statue came to be regarded as a reminder of failed promise, both for the city of St. Louis and for the unity of the nation and the failed promises of Reconstruction. But the most interesting aspect of the Thomas Hart Benton statue um, for me is actually a photograph uh, that was taken of Harriet Hosmer with her clay model. Uh, and it's one that probably many of us listening are familiar with. You've got Harriet Hosmer, little tiny Harriet Hosmer, up on top of this huge scaffolding, standing next to her uh, Thomas Hart Benton model, which absolutely towers over her. And it's just a great little photo. So I've, I've got that photo at the image gallery of thesculpturesfuneral.com. So if you go to thesculpturesfuneral.com, click on the image gallery for this episode, which is episode number 63. You can see that photo as well as images of Harriet Hosmer's work. But interesting historical photographs aside, there are two works by Hosmer which stand out from all her other work, both for their quality and for encapsulating Harriet's interest in women struggling between power and powerlessness as a result of their gender. And these are her statues of Beatrice Cenci and Queen Zenobia. Both of these subjects might be unfamiliar to today's audiences, but like many of Hosmer's other works, they would have been familiar to her contemporaries. Beatrice Cenci was an historical figure from the 16th century in Rome, the daughter of Count Francesco Cenci. According to several accounts, which vary in their details, Count Francesco Cenci habitually raped his daughter Beatrice. Beatrice tried to get papal authorities involved, but her pleas and accusations seemed to fall upon deaf ears. So in desperation, Beatrice, along with her brother and stepmother, hired a pair of assassins to murder her father, and the would-be assassins did succeed in drugging the Count, but their nerve failed when the time came to kill him. Now at this point, Beatrice took it upon herself to murder her incestuous father, either by driving a spike through his eye or beating him to death with a hammer. The accounts vary. So, the papal authorities in Rome, which seemed to have no problem with Beatrice being raped by her father, apparently cared when a woman killed someone, and Beatrice, along with most of her family, were executed in 1599. Now, the history of Beatrice Cenci and the legends that grew up around her became symbolic for the people of Rome who opposed or resisted oppressive authority of both the local aristocracy and the Holy See. And although locally famous in Rome, the story of Beatrice Cenci had recently reached a wider audience once again through poetry. Percy Shelley had written a drama in verse called The Cenci, a tragedy in five acts, just a few decades before Harriet Hosmer started working on her sculpture. So Harriet Hosmer was given this commission by a pretty unlikely client, the St. Louis Mercantile Library. Obviously, the library simply wanted to adorn their premises with a work by the famous Harriet Hosmer, and the choice of subject must have been left up to Harriet. And despite the gruesome and horrific details of the history of Beatrice Cenci, Harriet Hosmer's figure of Beatrice is, in my opinion, her most beautiful and moving of all her works. It's a single figure of Beatrice lying on some sort of platform, ostensibly in her jail cell, awaiting her execution. Her head is wrapped in sort of a turban, and rests on her arm, and in her other hand she holds a rosary. The figure is clothed in a dress with copious folds spiraling around her, her legs, framing her body, and leaving her arm and back and part of her breast bare. More than anything, this figure reminds me of Stefano Maderno's masterpiece Santa Cecilia, which is also in Rome, and for my money had to have been a reference for Harriet Hosmer's work. Harriet Hosmer completed her Beatrice Cenci in 1856 at the ripe old age of 27, and it surprised even her longtime supporters with its excellence. Her former master, John Gibson, helped to get the work shown at the Royal Academy in London, and reviews for it were unanimously positive, not only from patrons, but also, of course, from women's rights advocates, who saw in Harriet Hosmer a kindred spirit raising awareness of gender inequality through her art. Just as Hiram Powers had done ten years before, Harriet Hosmer arranged for her statue to go on a tour of the United States, 
and she exhibited the statue in Boston, New York, and Philadelphia before it arrived at St. Louis to stay. Now, by this point, Hosmer was seen as both a credit to the American arts and to womanhood, earning the praise from the likes of Susan B. Anthony and many other anti-abolitionist and pro-women's rights advocates. And in Hosmer's rendition of Beatrice Cenci, uh, her work takes kind of an interesting turn because Cenci wasn't merely a victim and martyr for the cause of womanhood. She was also an avenger, someone who fought back against the patriarchy and paid the ultimate price. Harriet Hosmer's very next large work, entitled Zenobia in Chains, would extend this theme of a woman empowered to fight for her existence. Hosmer seems to hit on the idea of doing Zenobia uh, while she was on her American tour and researched the character exhaustively. So, Queen Zenobia. She was a queen. She was the queen of Palmyra, which is now Syria, in the 2nd century AD. So she was another real historical figure, just like Beatrice Cenci. And she was queen at a time when her land was under Roman rule. Zenobia successfully led a revolt against the Roman Empire. She freed her kingdom, and she even expanded the territory of her kingdom by conquering Egypt and driving out the Romans there. Her empire was short-lived, however, as the Roman emperor Aurelian managed to capture her and bring her to Rome. And it is said that when she entered the city of Rome, she was paraded through the streets in golden chains. It's unclear as to what happened to her ultimately. There are various stories that either she died soon after entering Rome or perhaps was married off to a member of the Roman nobility. But the importance of Zenobia as a figure in history was that of a strong uh, female head of state who, even in her captivity, held her head high. Now, Harriet's Zenobia was finished in 1862 and was exhibited first at the, 18, at the 1862 London Exhibition and is, as the name implies, a woman in chains. Now, probably the best way to examine the significance of the statue of Zenobia is to compare her to another statue of a woman in chains, done by another American sculptor less than two decades prior. And of course, that is Hiram Powers' Greek slave. Now, I went into detail about the Greek slave in the Hiram Powers episode, so that might be worth a revisit to refresh your memory. But in a nutshell, the contrast between these two sculptures is stark. In the Greek slave, we find a chained, nude female, hardly grown into adulthood, the very picture of fragility and vulnerability and resignation in the face of her captors. Now, in the Zenobia, we find a powerful, towering woman. The sculpture is, in fact, over seven feet tall, and she's not exposed and nude, but draped in classical garments from head to foot, not in the way which reveals her feminine form, but in a way which gives her figure volume and solidity. Her wrists are indeed bound by chains, but rather than restricting her movement, the figure of Zenobia is actually striding forward with her head held high, revealing defiance in the face of her oppressors. Her dignity and physical presence are a refutation of Hiram Power's version of the chained female as vulnerable and available. When the sculpture was unveiled, the Zenobia, like many of Harriet Hosmer's works before it, was met with widespread acclaim. But if Harriet Hosmer and her work were so compelling in the 1860s, why is it that so few sculptors or lovers of sculpture know anything about her today? Why isn't her legacy to serve as a touchstone for women in the arts in the way that the Baroque painter Artemisia Gentileschi is? I'm not actually sure, but I think it might be a combination of factors. One is that Hosmer's best-known works, the Puck and the Thomas Hart Benton, aren't part of the body of her work which addresses the gender-related themes which she pursued throughout her career. So, so when people are casually familiar with Hosmer's work, it usually has nothing to do with uh, the major themes that motivated her throughout her career. Another big factor is that her work is done in the style of late neoclassicism, which, as I've mentioned, was falling out of favor in her own lifetime, and today can seem very clunky and artificial. And looking at her conceptual tour de force, Zenobia, 
were kind of bored, actually, with the schematic, blandly classicizing drapery and the well-worn neutrality in the facial expressions, which was all right in her master's master's time. But even in her own time, in the 1860s, the Zenobia could only have achieved success in the artistic outskirts of the young United States or Victorian England or Canovian Rome. The center of action by this time was, of course, Paris, awash with the sculptural genius of Carpeaux, the young Rodin, Jules Dalou, and dozens more, all pursuing new avenues of exploration light years beyond the strictures of the mythological, religious, or historical themes which proscribed late neoclassicism. Now, it's notable that Harriet Hosmer's style did evolve along more naturalistic lines later in her career, but after the 1860s, she produced relatively few works. As she was consumed, apparently, by a desire to invent, believe it or not, a perpetual motion machine. She spent at least 20 years on designing and building prototypes for perpetual motion machines, which, of course, came to nothing. As worthy as Harriet Hosmer's contribution to the history of sculpture actually are, I think her real legacy lies in the example she set for the next generations of female artists. Her continual notoriety in the newspapers back home in the United States emboldened dozens of women to follow in Harriet's footsteps and pursue a career as a sculptor, many actually eventually joining Harriet Hosmer in Rome. Few listeners will know uh, many of the names of these sculptors. There's Louisa Lander, Anne Whitney, Margaret Foley, Emma Stebbins, Edmonia Lewis, Vinnie Ream, and these are just a few of the more prominent sculptors who made their careers in the wake of of Harriet Hosmer. They all met with varying degrees of professional success, but their very existence is a remarkable achievement in the face of disadvantages few of us today could imagine. As a group, they were yet another manifestation of the individualistic, progressive identity which set the artistic milieu of the United States apart from the Europeans in the 19th century. And as such, they paved the way not only for generations of American female sculptors such as Melvina Hoffman and Anna Hyatt Huntington, but played a role in permanently changing attitudes towards women artists throughout Europe. Thanks for listening, everyone. Don't forget to uh, check us out at the Facebook group page where you can join in the conversation on Facebook, uh, do the whole online networking thing with uh, like-minded sculptors and sculpture lovers from all over the planet. You can also ask me a question there. You could post current events, uh, interesting news topics that come up uh, in your news feed, and you can get to know me and your fellow sculptors a little better. And don't forget, you can go to the website of the podcast, thesculptorsfuneral.com, where you can not only listen to the entire back catalog of shows, the first two seasons, you can also visit the image galleries for this and all the other episodes. And while you're there, of course, as always, uh, at thesculptorsfuneral.com, you can always click on the Blick Art Supplies link, which takes you to the Blick Art Supplies website, where you can support the podcast simply by buying your art supplies from Blick. And for that, I thank you very much. Thanks again for listening, and have a productive week.